today uh, we begin a new year. Anyone here made a New Year's resolution? I didn't think so. I don't know, I just, I just had it inside that this is one of those years where I'm still working on last year's New Year's resolution. How many would agree with that? I'm still working on last year's? <laughs> yeah, all right. So it's one of those Sundays, one of those Sundays, okay? But it's a new year. Uh, last year, the very first day of the year was the new year. This year, the very first day, I, of course it was, but it was a Sunday. <laughs> was the Sunday. A and this year, it it's the seventh day in, right? It it's kind of late for, for the new year because it's as far into the year as you could get before you have the new year. But uh, I just want to say, uh, Happy New Year. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, and we're going to start the new year with a, a new sermon series called The Stories of Jesus. And we're talking about parables. Parables are interesting stories because the parable or the story is really not the story. The story is what the parable depicts. There's always a meaning to the story. Jesus didn't tell stories to be an entertainer, uh, to make you feel good. He told the story to make a point. And that's what we want to look at. We want to look at these parables of the Lord. And uh, the first one, okay, I've got to fix my clicker here. This happens from time to time. All right, well, it, it goes into sleep mode. And so don't you go into sleep mode because it's a new year. All right, stay with me, all right. But we want to talk about a, a short parable of Jesus. Uh, it's found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. And it's a story about, well, the new and the old. The new and the old. And I thought that'd be appropriate for a new year, the new and the old. Um, it's the same old question is what we're dealing with. Uh, we've heard this everywhere. What are you doing? That's not the way it's done around here. You ever heard that? I mean, well, of course. I mean, hey, what, what are you doing? That's not the way it's done around here. This is the same old question. Now, I'm going to talk about why we ask that same old question, all right? And to do that, I've got a picture uh, of the pool table that we had in our basement as kids. Now, this isn't exactly the same one, but it's the closest I could find on the internet to what ours looked like. It didn't have a slate top. It had a masonite top, and it had cheap felt, okay, cheap bumpers, all of that. And uh, it's a good thing my folks got a cheap one because... With my younger brother and I, we were, we were terrible to this pool table. <laughs> All right? And kind of get the picture? In fact, we had learned that if you take your pool stick and you rub it back and forth on the felt pad, pretty soon you would have a little groove in it, depending where you put it. <laughs> then, then what you could do, you could put your ball on it and you'd hit it. All right? And that ball, as soon as they hit that groove, oh. <laughs> It'd go right into the pocket. I mean, we, we, had, we had done this so often. To play pool on our table, you just had to come near the pocket. And your ball would go in. it just hit that go right in. Why? Because there was a rut in the table. We get in ruts in life, and they're hard to get out of. Hard to get out of. I want to tell you about another rut. It's a different kind of rut. It's not one in the table. It, it's a... When I was a teenager, a friend of mine had this nice classic car, a 1962 Ford Galaxy. Only difference between the one in the picture and the one he had, his was a white convertible, and this one is a yellow convertible. But we discovered something as teenagers. Now, kids, I want you to tune out right now because we discovered that the wheelbase was the same width as railroad tracks. <laughs> and so, of course, we did what every inquisitive teenage kid would do. We found some railroad tracks, pulled our car up sideways on them and lined them up, and then we started driving down the railroad tracks. Now, there's something really interesting about this phenomenon. You see, when your car is driving down the asphalt, it's hitting something flat. And so the bottom of the tire is flat. And everybody says, hey, my car's got four flats. Of course it does, because the bottom side of your tire is always flat. It's flat on the, on the ground. But when you line it up with the rails, it gets a groove in the tire. The groove is not in the road, the groove is in the tire. 
So there we were, man, driving down the railroad tracks. You take your hand off the steering wheel because when you come to a curve, it just starts to turn all magically by itself. And you come curved the other way, it turns magically the other way around. And I only recommend doing this on abandoned tracks. All right? We were on abandoned tracks. And so what happens is you get in a groove, you get in a rut. And what I'm trying to say is, we ask this question, why are you doing that? That's not the way we've always done it. Why? It's because we are in a rut. We have habits in our life. Some people tried to get out of the rut they were in, in their eating habits last year, and they started a diet on the beginning of the year, and it lasted about three days. <laughs> huh? We get in other kinds of ruts. We get in financial ruts where we are just spend, 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 and all of a sudden we find ourselves in debt. We get in ourselves in, in, in ruts where we maybe drink too much, or you know what rut you're in. We get stuck in a rut where I am an angry person. Everybody knows I'm an angry person because any little thing sets me off. I just have no self-control. I'm stuck in a rut. Why? Because I've always done it that way. I've always responded that way. And I'm stuck in a rut. There are bad ruts to be stuck in. And there are good ruts to be stuck in. Some of you started reading your Bible every single day last year, and you read entirely through the Bible. Raise your hands. Come on. They got into a new rut. You know what happened this year? After they read through it last year, all of a sudden they realized, what am I supposed to read? Am I right? You got this time where you dedicate. You got into a new rut. That's a good rut to be in. Some people are in a prayer rut. It's a good rut. You know, they, 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 they've replaced some old bad habit with a new habit, and they find this new habit builds them up and strengthens them. And so you got bad ruts. You got good ruts. And then you got some that, well, they're good, but they've served their purpose kind of rut, right? I was in the habit of getting up and going to school every day for 12, well, you know, from the first grade all the way to the 12th grade. I was in that rut. Well, then I went beyond that. I didn't get out of the rut. Went to college, seminary, and all that. And I was in that rut. And at some point, I was in that rut, but I'm not in it anymore. I, 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 it served its purpose. I no longer need to be in that rut. And we all know the ruts of life, the habits of life. It's the way we've always done it. I've always done that. That's the way I've always done it. Many places in the Bible, it condemns tradition. The vain traditions of your fathers. You're doing it because you've only done it because it's always been done that way. I pick up in our, our text today the old way. John the Baptist's ministry. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus calls him the greatest of all the prophets. John the Baptist had a ministry According to Isaiah, Malachi, he was to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was to prepare the way for something new. Something new. And uh, he had a message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. Repent. Turn from your way. Get out of your rut, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John's disciples Follow John. That only makes sense. Jesus' disciples follow Jesus. So John's disciples are following and, and spreading this message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what that means was <clears throat> the king, King Jesus is coming, repent so that you will receive the Messiah when he comes. So a big change was about to take place. You might say that, the, that John the Baptist was a change agent. His mission was to get the people to change from the old to the new. He was a change agent. I like to think of myself as a change agent. Since I've been here, we've made a lot of changes, haven't we? At least a few, okay? Give me credit for a few, all right? We made a few changes, and that's what John the Baptist was doing. He's saying, listen, we've got to change because there's a new dispensation, a new economy, a new time coming. And, and, and it's Jesus. Jesus is going to change everything. 
Well, his disciples came and they asked the same old question about the difference. How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? How come you're not doing it the old way? Doggone it. We've always done it this way. Ever since Moses, we've been fasting. Come on, what's the deal here? How come you're not doing it the old way? That happens often around church. We do it once, and we're stuck in a rut. Well, hey, last year we did it this way. Well, guess what? It's not last year anymore, folks. <laughs> These disciples were lining themselves up with the Pharisees. Do you ever remember reading anything good about the Pharisees in the Bible? No. These were self-righteous people who were arrogant and felt they were above everybody else. And here you have the humble, lowly disciples of John saying, wait a second, we've never done it this way before. Why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus gives them a three-story answer, and here's our parables. And the point of these stories is not the story, it's the story behind the story. Jesus answered and said, the story of the groom and the best man. I call it the groom and the best man because Jesus is the groom in this story. And John, at best, is the best man because he's the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus answers that, how can the guests of a bridegroom mourn while he is with them? <clears throat> Wait a second. He's calling himself a bridegroom, which means it's a wedding. A wedding is a time of celebration and festivity, a time of, uh, of a union and a marriage. It's, it's the time where everybody rejoices. Uh, there's a reception, dinner, and, a, and in Bible times, it might have gone on for a whole week. This is great festivity. He says, no one mourns at a wedding. It's out of place. Out of place. The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast. It's not the appropriate or right time to be fasting because fasting goes with, with <clears throat> mourning and, and all of that. He says, but listen, if this is a time of celebration. The Lord has come. So he answers their question, why aren't you doing things the same old way as everyone else is doing them? He answers with a story to say, because it's not the right time time to do the same old, same old. It's time to do something new. Something new. He goes to a second story. The second story I call the new patch and the old cloth. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Now, I've grown up in the age of uh, everything is pre-shrunk. Anybody remember when they were not pre-shrunk? Oh, just raise your hand. You remember when they were not pretty strong? Okay. All right. All right. He says, here's why. You, you don't put a patch of unshrunk cloth on a garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment. It will shrink, and it will tear, tear the garment you sewed it to even more. I learned about this when I was a teenager. <clears throat> I didn't know about this. have to have things shrunk and unshrunk until one Sunday we were having a... <clears throat> I had my friends come to church, and, and afterward we went out to the Rouge Park, and we played some football in the afternoon, flag football. <clears throat> and I got, we got our car stuck in the mud. And my friend who had come to church with me that Sunday morning was in his suit. Well, we were just playing. Nobody was tackling or anything, so we could do this. And, and he was still in his suit, but the car was stuck in the mud. And so my friend Dennis, who lived just four do doors down from me on Westwood Street in Detroit, <clears throat> he got behind the back wheel. And when that car started to run and rock, it, it spit up dirt all the way up, mud all over the front of him. And here he is in his Sunday suit. <laughs> now, he was a good Catholic boy, so, I mean, it was a really nice Sunday suit, probably from confirmation, I don't know. But anyway, he had this nice suit, and it was, oh, man, he just muddy. And he said, oh, is my grandmother going to kill me? <laughs> you see, he lived with his grandma. <clears throat> he lived with his grandma. So he said, man, is my grandma going to kill me? So we said, oh, that's right. Listen, we'll, we'll go to Victor's house. We did, went to Victor's house. Victor lived a few more doors down from us. And uh, we got the garden hose out and we squirted them down. <laughs> I mean, we got them all wet. Now, now it's just on them. 
And then we said, okay, now we got all the mud off, okay? <clears throat> Take it off. We'll put it in the washing machine. We put it in the washing machine. Oh, yeah. And then we put it after that in the dryer. And the suit that he had came out about this tall. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. It was all sprung up, and there was poor Dennis and it, sitting in his underwear, so figuring out, how am I going to get that on? <laughs> it shrunk. I said, it shrinks. We, we ruined it. It ruined everything. And yeah, Dennis, <clears throat> he really got it when he got home. <laughs> you don't. He said, listen, you don't put something that is unshrunk on something that's already been shrunk. Because when it does shrink, it's just going to pull and destroy it. Jesus is saying, listen, you don't. You don't take the gospel and put it in the law. You don't, you don't take the new and put it in the old and expect it to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. He goes on and he tells one more story. <clears throat> okay, my battery must have clicked off on me again. Here we go. Let me try this. It goes to sleep on me if I'm not using it, so. There. <laughs> All right. He tells a story about new wine and old skins. Old skins. Neither do men pour new wine into old skins. If they do, the skins will burst. Here's why. When you put the unfermented juice in the, in the skin, <clears throat> in the process of fermentation, it expands. It expands the skin to its max. So if you then, the next year, say, I'm going to just put that in the old skin, you pour that in there, as it then begins to ferment and expand, it will burst the skin. And that's exactly what he said. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out. And the, and the, the wine skin will be ruined. No one will pour new wine into new wine skins. <clears throat> no, you put new wine in new wine skins so that they will both be preserved. Okay, that's what you do. Now the point behind all of this is saying is, listen, as great as John the Baptist and his ministry was, he was surpassed by Jesus and his ministry. The new has come. The new has come. As great as John the Baptist's baptism was, you remember that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. <clears throat> even though John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to, to loosen your, the, <clears throat> your sandals. I, I should be baptized by you. But Jesus said, no, this is to fulfill all righteousness. I, the Messiah, am identifying with you, the prophet, predicting a greater one is to come, I am he. And so he was baptized. I mean, as great as, as John the Baptist's baptism was, it was surpassed by Jesus. Jesus' baptism was not a baptism of repentance like John's baptism was. We know that from Acts chapter 19. It says, oh, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. But Jesus' baptism, according to Romans chapter 6, reflects that when I accepted Jesus Christ, I died with Jesus. He died for my sins, so I'm now dead to my sins. So when I get baptized, I go into the water, I'm being buried with Jesus, and then when I come up out of the water, I am raised with Jesus. It is a pantomime, object lesson format to tell everybody in the whole world, when I accepted Jesus, I died with him, I was buried with him, and I rose with him, and I do this publicly so everybody knows that I am. I'm a Christian. That's so different from John's. John's baptism was, hey, a Messiah is going to come. <clears throat> and so everything, the, the point is, it, it surpasses that. Now, I know that from Acts chapter 9, when the Apostle Paul came across some disciples of John who had not, been, <clears throat> had not received the Lord Jesus as Savior, they only were baptized by John. He said to them, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard there's the Holy Spirit. He said, and what baptism were you baptized by? They said, well, by John's baptism. He said, then he began to preach to them Jesus, and then he baptized them in the name of Jesus. They had to be rebaptized because they were not believers when they first got baptized, and so they had to be rebaptized. That's how the whole movement of Baptist came about. Baptists realized that uh, baptism, according to the book of Acts, is for believers only. And those who had been sprinkled or poured or even immersed as an infant, 
And he said, I wasn't a believer at that moment. So that was like John's baptism. It was before I was a believer. And so I need to be what was called rebaptized. They call it anabaptism. We were called Anabaptist. Later they dropped the name Anna and just called Baptist. But it's because you have to be a believer to be baptized. The point is, as great as John's baptism was, it was surpassed by Jesus' baptism. I'm saying all this because I want to say this. As great as 2017 was, and we went through all that last week, didn't we? Wasn't that great? All, all the great things God did here last year. As great as it was, it will be surpassed by 2018. My light verse, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's not about looking backwards. It's about looking forward. The point is, we don't want to put 2018 into 2017's mold. We want to see God do greater things in 2018 than we saw him do in 2017. Amen? Amen. I do. This year, we will not focus on reading through your Bible. We did that last year. This year, we're going to have a focus. Every month, we're going to have a memory verse to learn. And at the end of the year, you should have at least 12 Bible verses in your memory verse arsenal to equip you and to help you in a moment of need. We will be putting the Lord's Prayer up on the screen every Lord's Supper so that maybe you'll get it memorized just from repetition of saying it because there will become a point in your time maybe this year you'll need it. Some years ago, my wife needed it. She was in an operating situation, an operation, and uh, she had a mini stroke of sorts. And she began praying the only prayer that came to her mind the Lord's Prayer. Over and over and over. And then the doctors were able to do some modern marvels of getting rid of the, the, the blockage and all of that. And we need to have these things in our memory arsenal. And so we will focus on memorizing verses from the Bible. This year we're not going to have an old-fashioned Sunday. Well, that was great last year, wasn't it? Was that great? great fa old no, no. This year we're going to have a different kind of alternate theme Sunday. I already have one in mind, but I'm not telling you. You've got to wait till summer. All right. In 2017, I don't want to repeat that. Don't want to repeat that. I want to surpass that. Surpass that. Listen, our memory verse for January, it's in your bulletin. There's a little section there. You can cut it out. Okay, you can post it on, uh, on your dashboard, you can put it on your refrigerator. Uh, each week it'll be in the bulletin, so by the end of the, the month you could have four or five, depending on how many Sundays. And you can memorize this verse. This is our verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The day you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you become new. You get what Jesus called the new birth. You're born from above. You, you, you get the Spirit of God to empower you from within. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you're a believer in Jesus, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I love that verse. I love that verse. Because I don't have to do everything the way I used to do it. The old is gone. The new has come. The new has come. The Apostle Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 4 puts it this way. Put off the old man. It's like a garment. I almost brought a couple of suits out here and did a little changing routine for you. And I looked in my office and all I could see there was that Christmas suit that I had. <laughs> all right? But the whole idea, Paul says, listen, you take off the one, but it's not enough to take it off. You put on the new. You put on the new. You're a new person in Christ if you know Jesus. Your life should be one of constant change for the new, for the better. 
We're not going to do church around here the way we did it even in 2017. More changes are yet to come. And that's the way he intends it. You don't put new wine in old wineskins. You don't put an old patch, I mean an unshrunk patch, on an old garment. Listen, you, you put it on a new one, okay? God wants us to be new and dynamic. He wants us to be relevant to our culture with the message, the message of salvation that never changes but bridges all generations. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I don't know what you've struggled with in your resolutions in the past. I don't know what you're wanting to change in your life right now. I'm going to say this, only in Christ can you do it. You put off the old, you put on the new, you take in the new, you receive the new, you let the old go. Problem is, we like that old suit so much. I mean, it was comfortable. It, it fit well. To be honest with you, that Christmas suit that I wore, it was way too tight. I needed to lose a few pounds rather than not wear it. So I make, remember the ruts? There's the ruts that are in like the pool table, the road. And then there's the ruts that are inside the tire in me. I need to stay away from the ruts in the world. And I need to get rid of those ruts that are inside of me. I put off the old. I put on the new. I don't just give up a habit. I replace the habit. I get rid of the old, and I put on Jesus Christ. I get in his word. I pray. I memorize. I meet with God's people. I put off the old, and I put on the new. For if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Join me in memorizing that this year. Let's pray. Father in heaven. We begin this year with great anticipation that you're going to do great things in 2018. Beyond what you did in 2017, Lord, that in this year we will see the good hand of God resting upon us as Jesus builds his church. Lord, we know it won't be of our might, but it'll be by your spirit that things are accomplished. May we be a people sensitive to what you are doing. May your good, get, good hand be upon us. May you guide and direct us. Give us wisdom. Lord, know when to take off that which is old and when to put on that which is new. Now, Lord, uh, the fasting was not an evil. It was a good thing. And yet John's disciples needed to realize it was not time to fast. May we be like the men of Issachar who knew the times and knew what to do. Lord, we need to be able to be the people who see what's happening around us and how to be effective for Jesus Christ. Not because it's the way we've done it in the past, but Lord, we'll do the new to reach the new. Help us, O oh Lord, to be a church built upon the great confession, the great commandment, and the great commission. And bless us now, Lord, as we partake of the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.